G'day everyone and welcome to our YouTube channel Grizzly and Bear Overland. My wife Steffi and I have been driving around the world now for five years and we're currently in Australia with our French registered Land Rover Defender and four-wheel camper. How we brought that vehicle to Australia is what I'm going to talk about today in this video. Now I will be doing something a little bit different in this video. When I usually make my own videos I always write everything down that I'm going to talk about, whether it be in bullet points or write it out and then try to memorize the paragraphs and read them back, looking at the camera like this. But the amount of information that I want to share with you guys today about international shipping, it's quite a bit, so I am going to cheat please excuse me and I'm going to read off my little notebook here. Now I'm sure this video is not going to interest everybody and that's completely understandable. But if you've ever thought about shipping a vehicle to a foreign country, then this one is definitely for you. And even if you haven't, maybe you'll be interested just to see how much is really involved in what we do. Today I'll be talking specifically about Australia but I will be covering topics that are relevant to international shipping in general. All right, let's get started. Amongst the international overland community, of all the countries to travel in your own foreign registered vehicle, Australia would have to be one of the most daunting. So much so that a lot of international overlanders avoid Australia altogether. Now this doesn't have to be the case and today I'm going to take you through the entire procedure to bring your foreign registered vehicle to Australia. Before considering this I would ask you first if you're currently on a world trip or intending to begin or continue one after Australia. I ask this question because if your intention is only to bring your vehicle to travel Australia then ship back to your own country then possibly there are more economical options. If Australia is your only destination, then it may prove far less pricey to fly to Australia, buy an already equipped vehicle, complete your journey, then sell the vehicle. Not only could this be far more economical, but also a lot less stressful. If you are on a multi-country overland journey, like us and your vehicle is your home and sentimental to you, then most definitely you're going to want to bring it with you. If you've shipped a vehicle to Australia or done a little research into this, then you'll most probably have heard about this essential document that's required. This document is called a carnet du passage. Essentially, a carnet du passage is a customs declaration and guarantee on an object that will be temporarily imported into a country. There are only a half a dozen or so countries that still require a carnet. Australia is one of them, along with New Zealand, Japan, India and a few others. I will share a little loophole to avoid a carnet for Japan. If you arrive in person with your vehicle on a ferry from Russia or South Korea, a carnet is not required. Japan will issue a 12 month temporary import permit. Remember, this is only if you arrive on the same vessel as your vehicle. So how do we go about getting a carnet du passage? A carnet is typically issued by the Automobile Association in the country that the vehicle is registered in. I have heard it's possible to have a carnet issued by a foreign automobile association. I'm not sure why or in what circumstances someone would take this route. Maybe to save a few dollars or possibly that their own country has no authority to issue a carnet. As our vehicle is French registered, we applied for our carnet through the French Automobile Association. We filled out an online application, which was quite simple. If you do have questions, then give your automobile association a call and speak to somebody. Steffi called the French Automobile Association several times during our application and the lady was very helpful. You'll be required to enter all of the details for your vehicle, including the VIN number, registration details, etc. As the carnet is also a customs declaration, you'll be asked to list all accessories that are not standard to the vehicle. The space for this was limited, so we just listed a few things like the bull bar, winch, camper, etc. Not only is the carnet a customs declaration, it's also a guarantee that you will export this vehicle from the country before the carnet expires. Our money will only be refunded 
once the carnet has been stamped out of Australia and returned to the French Automobile Association. We have 12,000 euro deposited with the French Automobile Association. The French Automobile Association were quite flexible in the amount that we deposited. In fact, it was pretty much left up to us to decide. In saying that, I would recommend to be at least a little bit realistic in this. If we'd chosen to put $500 down as a deposit, I'm pretty sure the Australian border force would have been a little suspicious of our grizzly and bear being worth only that small amount of money. Each carnet requiring country will have an official amount required. This will always be a percentage of the value of the vehicle and varies greatly from country to country. Again, you should contact the Automobile Association in your country, tell them where you want to send your vehicle and they'll assist you. The carnet can be applied for within your own country or you can have it sent to you in another country. We've applied for two carnets over the years. One we had sent to Japan and the other to Taiwan. The carnet that we applied for in Japan was never used as we failed to reach Australia at that time. We sent it back and our deposit was refunded. All right, that's enough about carnets. Let's talk shipping. Once you've decided on a destination, it's time to think about how you will send the vehicle. We've always employed the services of shipping agents and customs brokers. I would highly recommend doing the same. Yes, it will cost you a little more, but will definitely reduce the stress of what can be a very stressful period. You're sending your vehicle, which is also your full-time home, along with all of your possessions across the ocean on a ship and hoping it's going to arrive safely at the other end. Of course, you're gonna be nervous. I recommend using social media or word of mouth for your shipping agents. It's good peace of mind knowing that somebody else you know has had a good experience with a certain agent. There are loads of Facebook groups to join. The Overland Association is a good one, along with all of the continent-specific Overland pages. The iOverland app has heaps of good information on shipping and agents. Once you have sourced a reliable agent, they are going to ask how you'd like to send your vehicle. Roll on, roll off or sea container are the two most common methods used. When building our rig five years ago, I had already planned to ensure the vehicle is able to fit inside a standard 20 foot sea container. The dimensions of all the types of containers can be found online. Be sure to check carefully. The door height of a container is about 10 centimeters lower than the internal height. We lowered our tire pressure to be able to clear the entrance. Another trick is to use ratchet straps or chain pulls to compress your suspension. This would only be if you needed a few extra centimeters. You don't want to keep it like this for an extended period. Once we had our vehicle inside the container, I pumped the tires back up to around 25 PSI. This still gave us a few centimeters roof clearance and ensured we didn't damage the rubber of the tires. If you are set on using a sea container, but you're just a bit too big for a 20 foot, then possibly a 40 foot high cube is an option. These containers are significantly more expensive, but if shared, can be more economical. If you're looking to share a container, tell your shipping agent and put some posts on the various Facebook pages. If your rig is a big rig, like our good mates over at The Outfit, then a roll-on roll-off vessel is probably your only option. A roll-on roll-off is essentially a massive vehicle ferry. We shipped roll-on roll-off from Japan to Taiwan with no issues at all. Some roll-on roll-off routes around the world have a bad reputation for theft and damage to your vehicle. During the voyage, your vehicle is left exposed on the ship. If there's a few dodgy ports along the way, or even a dodgy deck crew, it's quite common to have possessions or vehicle accessories stolen. We know many people personally that this has happened to. All right, so you've decided on how and when you're going to ship. In the weeks before shipping, we prepared all that was required to ship to Australia. All shipping companies will have different policies on what you can and can't ship. Communicate with your agent for all of this information. We were required to have almost empty fuel tanks and show photo evidence that our vehicle and camper's batteries were disconnected and safe. We disconnected the terminals and taped them up with electrical tape. All of our personal items that were not listed on our carnet de passage were listed on an Australian government unaccompanied personal effects form. 
Steffi did an absolutely amazing job of this with photos and descriptions and printouts of every single box. Anything that makes the customs officer's job easier at both ends means less stress for you as well. Now onto the part that scares everybody when they think about shipping a vehicle to Australia. Australia has some of the strictest quarantine rules on imported goods of anywhere in the world. Your vehicle needs to be absolutely spotless. We spent a week cleaning Grizzly and Bear at our mate Henry's garage in Taiwan. You need to be certain that when Australian Border Force inspect your vehicle, they don't find even a grain of sand. You can employ professionals to do this cleaning. This can be very costly. If you know your rig as well as we know ours, I'd say clean it yourself. The Australian Border Force will check thoroughly for plant matter, seeds, organic matter, insects, spiders, and anything else that could pose a threat to Australia's unique ecosystem. We were contacted by someone recently asking how we got the camper in with so much wood in the build. Wood is absolutely fine as long as it's treated wood. So if you've got a beautiful timber interior camper, do not be deterred. Just don't bring a bag of firewood with you straight from the forest. If you've got an older vehicle, then you also need to be sure that there is no asbestos components. This can be something as minor as an asbestos washer or gasket in your engine. The big deal with having your vehicle quarantined upon arrival in Australia and what frightens most people is the cost and justifiably so. We know a guy who had his camper quarantined because his fridge didn't meet Australian standards. He was charged $100 a day storage until they could get to his case. This went for 18 days and adds up very quickly. The same thing goes if your vehicle is quarantined for ecological reasons. If they do find organic matter, they'll quarantine your vehicle until they can clean it themselves. Then they'll send you a very big bill. If they find a bug, then they may want to stick your pride and joy in an oven, literally. There's the possibility that they could heat treat the vehicle at 60 degrees Celsius temperature, or at the very least, fumigate it. Again, you'll get the bill, so clean it thoroughly. You'll have other fees like loading fees and port fees that your broker will inform you of. If you attempt this process without using a broker or agent, you can save some money, but do your research. One little mistake and it could end up costing you much more. When loading your vehicle into a container, try to have it absolutely dry to avoid mold. Your rig will be in a big dark box for many weeks. If you load it damp, it could be a disastrous result at the other end. We used a heap of moisture absorbent sachets in the camper and car. We were loading during the Taiwanese wet season which had us slightly concerned. We did have a little mold on the seats and seatbelt, but nothing too bad. We know a couple that received their Defender in Fremantle, Western Australia with mold everywhere. Check out One Way North on Instagram to see what can happen. If you're shipping using a container and your vehicle is wide like ours, be aware that the vehicle may sway a little en route. When it's loaded, the vehicle will be secured using straps, but these can loosen over the voyage. I worked for 15 years in the offshore industry, so I know very well how wild it can get out there in the middle of the ocean. We removed our side awning just in case. All right, the vehicle is loaded in a container or delivered to the port for roll on, roll off. What now? Your shipping agent will have given you a schedule, but please remember shipping can be very unreliable, especially at the moment. From the time you drop your vehicle off to the time you receive it at the destination can be anything from weeks to months. If like us, your vehicle is your home and you're on a budget, I wouldn't recommend arriving to the destination too far in advance of the ship's scheduled arrival. Unless you've got something planned for the time it takes for your vehicle to arrive, you'll end up having to spend money on accommodation. I recommend arriving one to two weeks prior to the vehicle. This gives you time to meet your broker and organize any last minute requirements. Arriving later than your vehicle is not advisable as although your broker most probably can clear the vehicle through customs on your behalf, you'll get charged a storage fee until you can come and collect it. 
After your vehicle is underway, you can follow its journey using websites like Vessel Finder or Marine Traffic. Your shipping agent will provide you with the ship's name. The ship's location will be updated as it nears each destination along its voyage. Now this is not an exact update and you may go a week or so whilst the ship is in open ocean without updates, but it is pretty good. So much so that we followed our grizzly and bears voyage from Taiwan to Hong Kong, several ports in China, then to Singapore. In Singapore, our container changed ships and then we followed it all the way to Fremantle, Western Australia. Using these apps, we were able to be on the coast at Cottesloe in Western Australia and watched the Margaret River Bridge ship appear on the horizon. From the moment our container was unloaded, our customs broker Emilio from UCB took care of everything. As UCB is a designated Australian Border Force registered business, the container was able to be delivered by truck to Emilio's warehouse for unloading and inspection by Border Force. Now at this point, I will give a little bit of credit to ourselves. The massive cleaning effort that Steffi and myself did in Taiwan most certainly paid off. Emilio told us Border Force took only five minutes to approve our grizzly and bear for clearance. All right, back to the carnet du passage. At this point, Australian Border Force will stamp your carnet in the same way they'd stamp your passport. Be very sure to check and make sure that the dates are correct. You have 12 months in Australia with your foreign registered vehicle. This is 12 months from the time your carnet is issued, not from that date stamped by the customs officer. When applying for your carnet, you'll be asked what date you want the carnet to be active. Try to get this date as close as possible to the date that you believe you'll receive your vehicle. If you start it two months before your vehicle arrives, you've only got 10 months to explore Australia. Now your carnet can be extended from within Australia once only for a period of 12 months. This process needs to be started well before your initial carnet expires. We will be going through this process in the next couple of months and if you do go to all the effort to bring a foreign vehicle to Australia, I would highly recommend taking the extension. As you guys know, Australia is a massive country and in two years, you'll still only scratch the surface. We'll be contacting the Australian Automobile Association for all the details on how to do this. Our current carnet is valid until the end of June. We'll begin the application to extend most likely the end of March, early April. Shipping your own vehicle around the world can be a nerve wracking experience, but also super exciting. When we received the phone call from Emilio to inform us that we could come and collect our grizzly and bear, we were absolutely ecstatic. At this point, we inspected the vehicle and finalized all the documents with Emilio. Emilio then returns the carnet into our possession. We had delivered the carnet personally to Emilio a few weeks prior to this day. So we've officially got the keys to our French registered Land Rover Defender and we're on Australian soil. Time to hit the road? Not quite. There's still a few more things that need to be done before we can legally start our Aussie adventure. At this point, our vehicle is not licensed to drive on Australian roads. We need to first apply for a temporary movement permit on the Western Australian Department of Transport website. This is quite simple, around 20 bucks from memory and it's issued instantly. This permit allows you to drive an unregistered vehicle for 48 hours. You will need to use this 48 hours to take your vehicle to an approved roadworthy inspection center. If your vehicle is in decent condition, and has passed inspections in its registered country, then you should have no issues. The inspection of grizzly and bear lasted 10 minutes. The inspection center will issue you with your roadworthy certificate. Be sure to check all of the details match up here. Name of the person to whom the car is registered to in its home country. In our case, this is Steffi. Yes, grizzly and bear belongs to Steffi. As she likes to remind me, it's her defender and I'm just the chauffeur. Also check the registration number and chassis or VIN number. Roadworthy certificate in hand, surely that's it. Time to head to the bush, right? Not yet. We've still got one more thing left to do. The final step in this process is to visit a licensing center with your roadworthy certificate. The licensing center will then issue you with a motor vehicle insurance. 
This is like a public liability document. Your vehicle does not become registered in Australia and you will retain your own registration plates. With this document in hand, you are now officially free to go. From the moment we decided to ship our vehicle from Taiwan to Australia, the entire duration to the time we received it in Fremantle was about six weeks. The total cost was roughly $7,000 Australian. This cost includes everything. The shipping container, loading fees, port fees, shipping agent, customs brokers at both ends, along with all the things I just covered. All right, that was a long one. I do hope that all of that information can be of some use. Not just for shipping to Australia, but shipping in general. Australia is possibly up there as one of the more complicated countries in the world to send your foreign registered vehicle. So I reckon if you can ship to Australia, you can ship anywhere. If you feel that I've missed any important information in this video, then please do feel free to leave a comment below with advice or your own experiences. Have you shipped your own vehicle internationally? We'd love to hear from you. Was it a problem-free experience or did things get messy? Thank you so much for bearing with me on this one. I know it's possibly not the most exciting topic, but definitely a relevant one. Take care and we'll see you next time.